very uh, honored to be back in a different way, but to be back with you folks. Uh, I've done a few uh, programs uh, in the past in your wonderful symposium a number of years ago. I was uh, there as a vendor and uh, presented a program and, and enjoyed the wonderful exhibit and all the trees that you um, displayed. And uh, it's always inspiring to go back there. So I was hoping to be there right now with, with Larry and you folks, but uh, things, things change. And um, so anyways, uh, I was asked to uh, discuss a favorite topic of mine, uh, it's literati or Boon Jin. And um, it's a, a subject, at a, and we'll call it a style of tree that uh, I think uh, has beautiful form, natu natural form to it. And there's other things that uh, come to mind with literati, uh, the meaning of it. And I was going to ask uh, some of you, if you just volunteer, uh, to give me your definition, just in a few words, of um, what literati or bunjin means to you. And it doesn't have to necessarily be tree related. It could be something else. And, uh, and then we'll, we'll, we'll get more into uh, some other people's uh, ideas that I've jotted down over the years that I thought were good uh, definitions or capturing the essence of literati. So, uh, not to pick on anybody, but Larry, why don't you start? Uh, thanks, Jim. <laughs> uh, for me, literati is what I've seen um, growing in the mountains. Wild trees in the mountains uh, very often are very sparse and living right on the edge of survivability, but they show this great, interesting form and character. Someone else? Minimalistic. Did you hear that or? No, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't hear. Okay. I was going to say minimalistic. Minimalistic, uh, okay. Style without a style. Here. I think I would, I would agree with uh, Larry's assessment that from everything I've read and, and understood, uh, literati or trees that are made to appear to be uh, sort of hanging on. They're trees that have been there for a long time, struggled, really uh, been uh, battered by the environment, and they uh, they develop this very um, ascetic kind of feeling about them, and uh, usually with some interesting movement as well. Great. Someone else? I feel like they look like calligraphy or very figurative in their movement. Okay, calligraphy. Brushwork. Yeah, that was one of the inspirations for this uh, form. On, on Boon Jin or Literati. And um, I'd like to, um, as far as a design concept, that the, the focus is on the whole and not the donut. And it's a style of uh, oriental view of nature. Now, uh, here in the United States, it, uh, it could be our view of nature. And where your backyard is in wonderful Colorado, uh, it's very uh, stimulating. And uh, it just, uh, when, when I know when I'm up in the mountains uh, uh, with Larry and, and uh, the trees, uh, it, it just takes you somewhere that uh, you couldn't possibly be anywhere else. And uh, so it's a, it's a wonderful way of viewing nature uh, at its best. Boon Jin means um, a literati person or um, a literary person, or uh, not to be chauvinistic, but men of books or people of knowledge, I like to put it. And people who work with literature and art, uh, different forms of art. Uh, somebody mentioned calligraphy as an inspiration and in design. Um, tea, as I mentioned, but uh, the tea and the tea ceremony were part of it. Uh, music, as we talked about. Um, 
uh, Ikebana, which is a, a flower arranging, and uh, known as Bunjun uh, uh, Bana, and bonsai also, just straight bonsai. And approximately 2,000 years ago, arguably, the Chinese started this, uh, started bonsai. And, uh, and simply, the translation is a Japanese term, tree and pot, or plant and pot. But it goes, of course, beyond that, or we wouldn't be sitting here in our homes uh, discussing it tonight. Um, uh, but uh, something draws us to this art form, this living art form. And um, the literati class of people, imagine one day they were um, sitting around, and uh, mostly they were uh, monks and uh, scholars, and uh, they discussed uh, many things, as mentioned, uh, many art forms, and they were probably painting a picture and, um, and uh, probably looking at the mountains as an inspiration and the trees in the mountains, and somebody said, hey, let's go up and uh, let's dig one of these trees out, bring it down, and put it in a pot, and we're going to discuss it firsthand, and, you know, in front of us all. And that's probably how something like um, Bunjin began. And uh, they might have spent days on talking about just the angle of the trunk and how it would be uh, positioned, or if a branch should be eliminated, or if it should be brought in a different direction, such as we do today uh, with our trees. So somebody had started this some time ago, and uh, and through. China went to Korea and then to Japan. And like many things, the Japanese took somebody else's idea and really went with it and uh, perfected it to, to their lifestyle and their, their uh, views of nature. And so it's been a, it's been a wonderful ride for the last 2000 years as far as, far as uh, plant concerns are. are. And uh, it was uh, known as Wen Jin in, in um, uh, China and, and uh, uh, the Tron paintings uh, started approximately 600 AD and, uh, and uh, in the Qing Dynasty it was very popular in the 1600s uh, up until 1900s. And uh, in 1748, um, just for a little history, uh, the Mustard Seed Catalog was uh, written, it was hand drawings of uh, all types of uh, plants and animals and insects and uh, uh, rocks, uh, lots of rock formations. And this is where the first evidence uh, in written form of bonsai appears. And a gentleman in Rochester, New York, William Valvanus, he has one of the original mustard seed catalogs, which I got to see. He let me page through it and everything. And it's a wonderful study of nature through, through drawings. And I have, uh, and while I was in China, I bought uh, some books, uh, copies of it, uh, so I could uh, get inspired when I'm, when I'm uh, uh, working on trees sometimes. And during the Edo period, uh, against the Shogun's uh, stereotyped art, an interest in Confucian uh, studies were, and that brought on uh, the beginning of thoughts again of uh, Bunjin uh, to the Japanese. And then Kyoto, when that was the capital, the art of elegance and understatement was very popular. And from that, uh, 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 Bunjin really grew in, in Japan and is still very popular today. Years ago in Japan, when you were studying bonsai or you were become uh, a master, we'll call it. I don't like that term, but uh, if you become uh, a person of knowledge with bonsai, you were restricted from doing uh, bunjin design on trees until you uh, had a certain elevation of knowledge. And so this, this particular style, we'll call it, um, was reserved for for the people that uh, uh, became very knowledgeable in, in this art form. So it's a style without style guidelines. Um, generally speaking, uh, 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 what makes a good literati is um, a tr the trunk line is very interesting. 
Uh, it should, not always, but it should have at least three movements in the trunk line uh, to have a good candidate for literati. Now we can make the, the movements if, if we had a straight trunk tree that we would like to uh, use for literati, uh, of course, through wiring and weights and uh, maybe pruning part of uh, notching out a trunk, trunk to uh, get a different direction. So we do all those kind of little tricks for our, our, our design of trees. Uh, but um, um, with the Bunjin, uh, usually it's the upper third of the tree that has the foliage part and or the strong foli foliage element, but the trunk line is what we really uh, focus on as far as design. Uh, the branches can cross each other, they can cross the trunk. So we're, I just said they don't have guidelines, but uh, sometimes um, if you learn what I call guidelines, I don't like the word rules, uh, but the guidelines, uh, you break them. And that's, a that's your artistic um, uh, approach to uh, any, any art is what's in you bringing it out. And uh, my, my uh, background in art is uh, dance. I danced uh, professionally and I danced for over 30 years. And um, so I see people's torsos in trees. And I use that as a foundation of design for, for mine and music, of course, I love music, but uh, the torso in a tree is the first element uh, that we should bring out in, as far as the beauty of, of uh, uh, Bunjin or any style of bonsai for that matter. So it's very simple uh, simplicity with balance though. And uh, so that's sometimes very difficult. I think, um, uh, literati or Bunshin is the most difficult style. And um, so it's, it's, um, it's uh, something that uh, you have to keep looking at. And as I mentioned about the hole, not the donut, uh, spaces in between the branches that are created through, through your, your design and your approach to the, the elements. Can this be literati? Anyone? Tony? What do you think? Or is he muted? He is muted. <laughs> oh, he's muted. All right. Um, I, you compared it to a musical note, and that was a music note. Yes. And so... In a way, it could be, and and with a with a a a, a bowl like that, uh, the music changes. It as I stroked the mallet around it, it became louder and softer, and higher pitched and lower pitched. So just like the movement of a trunk, uh, that it changes directions, it moves. It sometimes will go down, and it'll actually drop and then go up again. So. I think it's a it's a good inspirational way of uh, looking at at bonsai uh, through sound, and uh, you know uh, it's I think uh, uh, another another way we can trick ourselves into uh, finding art in our trees. So years ago, uh, while I was thinking about this subject, I wrote down some words that I thought were important. Um, in trying to describe Bunjin or literati. And the first word is discovery. So as Larry goes in the mountains and some of you other folks have uh, collected trees in the mountains, you are walking and walking and walking and you're seeing something in the distance that uh, you get excited about. And you go up to that tree and uh, see if it's a possible tree to, uh, to uh, harvest and take down and nurture, grow and nurture, nurture the tree and then um, um, uh, 
after that its health is up, uh, then you might put your styling into it. And you're already probably thinking about styling it when you're collecting the tree. So the first word in my thoughts were discovery. And then after you discover the tree, you're inspired by it because you got it out of the ground or out of a pocket of uh, stone. And uh, you get excited about the tree. You may take it down to your, the truck and drive off and go to your home and put it in a pot and um, start looking at it and say, wow, this, this tree really captures what I saw today in the mountains. And so you're, you're inspired by the tree. And then you start looking at the essence of the tree. And essence is a, is a good word because it, it, um, it gives the tree a sense of humanity in a, in a way. It has its own character. Why, does this, why did I bring this tree down over some other tree? And it, it's, it's a, a feeling that, that uh, uh, exhumes from the tree and, and uh, gives you uh, uh, a one-on-one -on -one with the tree. So that kind of like a relationship with the tree. So trees, and this is another subject I'm involved with, but trees have f feelings, I believe, and they have other ways of communication. And one of them is, is through us looking at the tree and, and enjoying it in, in that way. And after the essence, um, it's evolution. Evolution, uh, the tree evolves into uh, something uh, with our hands and our thoughts, and uh, it evolves into uh, uh, maybe more beauty. Sometimes not always, but <laughs> say, hey, what, what were you thinking there? But uh, it's a spirit of evolution that, that happens with the tree. And then it's uh, become spiritual. And spiritual is a, is a strong word, and it's not religious connotations, but uh, the tree has a long life. And so we can enjoy the tree, others can enjoy the tree, and get a feeling from it. And uh, so um, the spiritual part is um, something that's more personal, but uh, uh, some trees, I think, can take you in that direction. And the last word that uh, I, I thought for literati would be uh, uh, continuation. Trees are a type of, uh, my, my screen is moving because my dog is chewing on the cord. <laughs> Libby? Yes. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I thought, yeah, why is this new? She had her feet around. Anyway, we're, we're back. Um, so anyways, uh, the feeling of continuation is uh, something we have with our trees and the thoughts like uh, Larry years ago asked, he was in my backyard and uh, uh, I offered a tree if he wanted one for the, uh, for the collection in, in the botanic garden and uh, uh, he, cho he chose a spruce and it's, uh, hopefully it's there today, dead or alive. And, it is. Oh, it's it's there. <laughs> it's alive and well. It's on display as we speak. Okay. Oh, well, cool. So, anyways, I, I told Larry the story. I got this out of a dumpster. Uh, some nursery was throwing it away while I was there buying some azaleas, and they threw this uh, spruce away in the dumpster. And I asked them if I could have anything in their dumpster. And they looked at me funny and said, "Yeah, so uh, go for it." So, anyways, now it's. Now it's uh, dumpster diving to, uh, to on display, but this feeling of continuation is nice for us because we can have our trees for um, our lifetime and enjoy them, and then they're gonna outlive us. So they're gonna uh, continue to be enjoyed, hopefully you know, enjoyed by somebody else and somebody else and so on. And there's trees like in Japan that have been in five, six, seven generations of family members. And, the, uh, and will continue on. So a lot of these trees will outgrow or outlive their counterpart in nature. And so that's a great feeling to do, you know, have bonsai and have a, have a tree that's gonna, you know, live on and, and hopefully be enjoyed by others. So I took those words, and I don't know if you can see it on the screen, but I took those words and uh, just did a little drawing with the, with the names and, connected them. And there we go. And uh, if we were in person, I would just do it there in person. But this one's uh, 
this one's the original. <laughs> uh, but anyways, a, a feeling of uh, those seven words into a tree form. We're going to show some slides now um, and uh, give you examples of bonsai uh, as literati. And uh, if anybody wants to chime in, ask a question, do a comment, please do. As I'm going on, I will I'll just uh, stop talking for a minute and then we can uh, continue on here. So Libby's gonna set this up now. Okay. Hmm. I don't know how to get that stuff on the side off, so I'll just stick it over there. Can you see it, Literati? Yes. Give a yeah. thumbs up. Everybody okay. see this? Okay. okay. Yeah. yeah. It's good. Okay, so, um, so this is a tree I've had for a number of years that uh, I didn't start it. It was started in Japan a long time ago, and I'm um, just continuing growing it. Uh, uh, the drop branch was, well, the whole tree was very thin and small, but uh, I tried to capture the feeling of a, a, a classical, we'll say, uh, bunjin, uh, which is a Japanese term for literati. And um, uh, I think as, as time goes on, this tree will uh, continue in that, in that uh, manner. Uh, anybody, is this literati to you? Early nature. Yeah, it's nature. And literati can have a feeling of water. Uh, as I mentioned, we, we, we meditate uh, over trees uh, a lot of times in the morning when we meditate and we put a tree in front of us. And it, it gives us a little feeling of uh, nature, of course, with our meditation. But this is kind of weighty. It's, uh, it's earthy, it's down to the earth, so it's, it's more earth breath. Uh, uh, air breath would be probably more uh, insightful for uh, the feeling of literati. How about this, uh, this creature here? Anybody? Is this literati? In the bird world? It seems a little too ornate. Okay. No, it's, I don't think it's, um, it's too showy. It's too showy. Too showy. Less okay. showy. All right. Uh, um, I, sh I should. Go very ahead. flighty. Very what? Flighty. Flighty. Okay. Flighty. Yes. Yeah. Maybe I should show this picture uh, in black and white. <laughs> then it would be less showy. And but I think the form, the neckline, and everything, and the tail. Uh, and the and the and the thin legs uh, give it a feeling of literati in, in some ways. Uh, I took this picture at a castle in Czech Republic <laughs> one time, and this this uh, guy or gal uh, was following me the whole day or the whole morning. I was there for about three hours, uh, just walking the grounds. So There's nobody there except me and and her, and uh, so I took a lot of pictures. Of of this uh, this bird here. How about this uh, friend of mine here climbing up our our wall of the greenhouse? This is a black snake. Uh, it's about six seven feet long. It's been a friend of mine for many years, and actually, uh, she finds her way into our basement every year. I don't know how, but she has her own ways. And she goes in the basement and lives in our basement and we don't have any mice problems or uh, other rodent problems in the winter. And then I find her either in the basement or she's at the top of the steps and uh, wants to go out. And I let her out every spring. And this year was no exception. Uh, she was uh, waiting to come out in the springtime when it got warmer. But I think this, go ahead. It has three bends. Three has, yeah, it has yeah. minimum of three bends there. So, yeah, one time I was teaching this course at uh, Ron Lang. He's a very great potter, him and his wife, Sharon Edwards Russell. 
and they had a kiln opening every year for about seven years. And I would design a pot in a theme uh, to teach a workshop during the kiln opening. And one year I was doing literati and I said, well, if we had a snake, I could put it in the pot and uh, give you good ideas for, for tree design with it. And somebody looked over the wood pile and sure enough, there was a black snake kind of on cue. So I went over and caught it and I put it in the pot and they're very easy to tame. I put it in a pot and then we use that for uh, inspiration for the workshop. So, and this is uh, making more literatis. Um, these two were entangled <laughs> on my driveway one morning. And uh, so this is the process of literati in the, in the reptile world. And uh, top of Mount Hood, at the tree line, uh, some trees uh, die back, the, the apex dies back, uh, and they can be kept on. And uh, this, this uh, slight movement in this one branch that uh, the, the, the raven decided to um, hang out with, uh, I felt was caught the essence of literati. And this is a familiar sight for you folks and uh, all the beauty of nature uh, in, in uh, uh, growing out of granite and other rock forms and uh, just uh, studying how trees grow in different elevations, very inspirational. Is this in Pennsylvania, Jim? No, actually, <clears throat> excuse me, this is in Winnipeg. <laughs> oh. And I was teaching there and they hired me to uh, teach some workshops and programs and they also hired me to teach them how to collect. And so uh, we went up and uh, collected a few trees. Uh, and then on the way home, they said, you want to see some larch? And uh, we pulled off the highway and there was literally acres and acres of larch, uh, mostly literati, growing in a bog-like area that were owned by the, the native uh, uh, folks of, of the Winnipeg area and they were gonna widen the highway so that actually the club got permission to uh, dig larch. <laughs> I said, well, get as many as you can because it's gonna be bulldozed over. So um, we did a couple quick digs of larch in that, that area too. Is this literati? I think the Italians would think so. Could be. And uh, a tree right after uh, design, um, a um, blue atlas cedar. So not native, of course, to the United States, but uh, still a, a, a nice example and a start. This was this freshly styled. And back to uh, Prague, uh, I saw this on a wall and it gave me that feeling of literati. And one of our native trees to Pennsylvania, pitch pine, which I like to collect a lot. And um, a tree in nature. Um, I think this was in uh, Europe. Somewhere in uh, Austria. Russell pine cone that's about this tall that's growing out of a tree stump up in yeah, it's this is not a bristle cone, but it, it has that feeling, doesn't it? Yeah, this is probably Scott's pine here. Sometimes to just do a simple drawing before you even start the style of, of a tree. Sometimes that helps. You don't have to be a good artist to uh, um, just draw a simple a trunk line and a little bit of branch pattern, and uh, that can be your start for your design. Um, this was a student. This was the first tree he ever styled, ever. And I uh, thought he did a pretty good job in the, in the initial styling of this tree. This was a little uh, Engelman spruce. Another Engelman. And <clears throat> one of the uh, classes I taught at uh, uh, 
Ron Langs and Sharon. Uh, this was uh, the birth of bonsai. So we designed these pots to look like uh, eggs hatching and what was coming out of the egg. And then uh, I just ask everybody to be literal, literati like <laughs> for the photo. And uh, Black Hill Spruce. And uh, this was a student of mine at the uh, initial styling of a uh, lodgepole pine. <clears throat> Literati doesn't have to always be conifers. It can be deciduous. And uh, this was at Taikon 10 a few years back. I took my daughter there and um, our first and only trip together in Japan. But uh, we saw this tree and it was very inspirational and um, it is a little showy with the fruit on it, but uh, you get the idea with the form of the tree and the, and the beautiful lines that have natural grace, as I mentioned earlier. Another uh, very insp inspirational tree. Maybe the foliage is a little too heavy because someone mentioned about the tree struggling but still survives. And uh, so it's, it's uh, foliage is usually very sparse. Uh, so this could be maybe pruned out a little bit, but look at the killer trunk and the, and the, uh, the dive, the, the uh, switchback of the, of the apex, uh, just wonderful tree. And I like the pot. Uh, Lemonade. Uh, it really, yes? Somebody have a comment? Okay. Another one, and I like this in the pot combination. The footage makes it elevate a little bit. And uh, of course, the, there's lots of movements in this uh, trunk line. And uh, this is the guy I cut one. And uh, he cut a lot of branches. And uh, Larry comes and teaches at our, our place. Uh, we look forward to him every, every time he comes. And we have a great time. And this is a little tree. I think it was in a workshop. I don't know if it was a demo, but uh, anyways, uh, it was part of Larry's uh, uh, few days with us and, uh, and what, what came about from a, a little Engelman spruce. And uh, another place of inspiration, uh, we have a, 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 a collection of trees in um, about 70 miles from us. It's called the Kennett Collection. And it's uh, arguably one of the best collections in the country, if not the world. Um, Doug has approximately 2,000 world-class trees. And uh, uh, Larry and I visited him um, a couple years back to, to see his trees. And by the way, Larry, he's moving. And uh, he's move, you know, he's taking down all his displays and so on, and moving into a, an estate um, and and uh, reducing his collection to about only twelve to fifteen hundred trees. In. And here's a tree that I got to get another picture of, but this is the beginning of a tree that I collected. It's a uh, pitch pine, and it was very straight and upward. And um, so I started the design process a number of years ago and brought the, uh, got some movement in the trunk line and then uh, brought it actually back up again uh, today. And I'm, I'm not sure if I have a current picture of it, but at least this is the beginning. Uh, after collecting the tree and it's healthy, uh, you can put it in a, in a, a file drawer <laughs> as a box or a container. And I left the wild blueberries grow with it and uh, just to make it feel at home in the beginning. And this is after the initial styling, same tree. And I'm working on a uh, container for it with Ron Lang. Uh, so we're gonna design a container, actually have the design finished. So uh, it's gonna go in a nice container next year. Another tree that I found collecting in Pennsylvania, I was taking a pea break and uh, this tree was at my feet. It was only about a foot, foot and a half tall. 
but I, I started studying it while standing there and I liked the tree so I collected it and it's an eastern white pine, our native tree in, in uh, eastern Pennsylvania or eastern part of the United States. And I uh, got the needles to reduce nicely and uh, put it in a, an exhibit, the national exhibit years ago. And uh, several people wanted to buy the tree and I, I didn't want to sell it. But uh, then one person came up and he was the curator of the Chicago Botanic Garden, uh, Ivan Waters. And he wanted to buy the tree. And I said, oh, I'm not sure about that. And then I saw him later and I said, why, why do you want this tree? And he says, why? Well, I want it for the collection at the Chicago Botanic Gardens. And I said, oh, I thought he wanted it personally. And I said, I'll, let me think about it. So um, Mary Kay and I uh, discussed it and um, we decided to donate half of it and sell half of it to the Botanic Garden. He had a, a, a somebody donated money to purchase a tree. So, um, and this tree's, uh, you know, American tree. And I have this thing I like, uh, American trees to be in American pots. And so Sarah Rayner's um, pot is uh, being displayed with this. And there's a new pot being designed again by Ron Lang that's gonna go in there. So it's in Chicago Botanic Garden. And when Mary Kay died a few years ago, um, uh, Chicago uh, did an honorarium through this tree for her. And I, th I was very honored uh, that uh, they thought so much of her and that uh, they would dedicate a year's display with this particular tree. And uh, I think one of the first collecting trips that uh, Larry and I did together was with Mary Kay. And um, I have a whole series of slides of that day or those couple days that we did. And uh, uh, it, was a, it was a wonderful time. So you have nice memories through your trees. And here's the tree today, or a few years ago, I should say, in, in Chicago. So a little bit of change in the design, but pretty much uh, maintain its elegance. It's a tree from Colorado, um, Colorado blue spruce, killer trunk line, uh, had some great movement. It's a little heavy for Boon Jin, but uh, it's pretty darn close. So this was a few years after it was collected and then the initial styling of the tree. And, um, a uh, gentleman, uh, Eric in uh, Cleveland, owns the tree today, and it's been restyled again. But uh, it, it had a this trunk line you can't change. You can just admire so much, and it's in a different container now. And some friends uh, that style trees. Uh, Flex was with me uh, uh, with Larry uh, a few years back, and Marl Stemberger from Italy. And here's a tree that I uh, was doing at Brussels years ago. I, found, I picked this out. I was allowed to pick out any tree for styling. And I chose this ponderosa pine because I liked the, the trunk line of it. And uh, so I, I didn't have much uh, pruning on the top, just uh, some wiring and carving. And uh, having you know, a couple hours to design a tree, I wanted to make sure I got it done in, in the lot of time. So this was the initial design of the first uh, styling of that particular tree. Sometimes you put things in focus and a little cherry tree can be a wonderful um, literati feeling. And of course the pot is way too heavy for this, but this is just the initial wiring out of the tree and uh, uh, a little splash of color in the spring never hurts. Now this is at a neat place, uh, ended up, we had a friend in Colorado and he and his wife were leaving for a week and they gave us uh, a, their place to stay. So we ended up in uh, Netherland, uh, Netherland, Colorado, a very unique place. And it was like going back in time for me. <laughs> and uh, so anyways, this was on the bathroom wall. <laughs> in Netherland, if you ever visit there. Anybody's been there? Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> Pretty neat place. So first head shop I ever saw, <laughs> legal one. So. 
And when you're styling trees, uh, this is the, the raw material. Uh, again, another Engelman spruce, I love them. And they grow very well here. We don't have problems with them. And uh, so anyways, uh, they're very easy to style as far as uh, man maneuvering trunks and branches. And so this was a, a program I was doing in Long Island one time. And so I just uh, took off the leader and uh, started bringing the, uh, the tree in. And this was the initial styling of the tree. And then I'm drawing a picture and you can see from the picture, it's very sparse. And what I do with design work is I try not to um, take off too much. Uh, too much to me would be more than 50% of the, of the foliage uh, in, a, in the initial styling. And so I'm drawing a picture of what it should be maybe in five to 10 years by editing some of these branches. But I always say that a, a poorly styled live tree is much better than a greatly styled dead tree. So I, I leave things on not for the ego, but for the health of the tree. And back to Japan, and we're gonna uh, shortly discuss uh, Kato or design. And uh, of every two to three years, I go to uh, 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 Ueno, which is uh, where Coco Futen is. I ran into Larry in, uh, this year there. So we had lunch together in Japan, which is pretty cool. And uh, anyways, this was not at the uh, Coco Futen display of trees, but this was a display of stones. And the Suiseki, uh, there is a, society there that puts on through uh, Seiji uh, Morimai and uh, this was an exhibit. So the main feature of this display that we're looking at is actually the stone, not the tree. And um, a couple ways that you can tell because the tree is actually a very strong element. So it's hard to say what's the strongest part of this particular display? Is it the tree? Is it the stone? Or even could be the scroll? And how I could tell um, it's the stone is one simple way of display on the scroll. And if you see on the bottom of the mountain, the Fuji, I'm sure, there's a little square block and that's called a chop and that's the signature of the artist of the scroll. And that is always placed on the opposite side of the main feature of the display. So being on the left side of the scroll, the right side element is the feature of the display. So there's a little fun fact that it took me a long time to figure out and I was I had to be told, <laughs> as I mentioned there. Um, Friends tree in, um, in uh, Germany. And uh, this was a collected uh, Scots pine. And I think a wonderful trunk. Uh, uh, it's probably gonna be edited a little more on the top, but it has some beautiful makings that has the bones of a, of a future uh, literati, I think. And uh, this trunk line is just awesome. And a tree you saw earlier in the, in the video, um, uh, this is a tree actually was collected in Spain and it was given to me by Pius Nodder in Switzerland when I was visiting his garden and he gave it to me and it has, I think, natural style without doing too much uh, with it. I did rework it this spring and uh, edited some more branches uh, because the trunk line is the beauty, I think, of this tree and it's in a, a Don Gould pot, maybe a little heavy pot for it, but uh, I, I, uh, I certainly enjoy uh, his pots. And uh, that, that blows my idea. This should be an, actually in a European potter, potter's pot and not American pot, but uh, I thought it was a nice combination. And back in, uh, in Germany, um, Robert Barth, uh, this is one of his trees with a, with great, uh, great movement. And as I mentioned, uh, it doesn't, doesn't have to be a conifer always. This is a, a sumac and a very elegant natural 
uh, movement. And down in uh, North Carolina in Asheville, there's a wonderful collection there. Uh, it's part of the uh, North Carolina Arboretum. And uh, uh, the background was uh, hand painted uh, to feel like the trees in the clouds, which uh, this is probably where it was collected originally. Yes. Yes. Jim, was that pot on the previous? Who made that? Uh, I honestly don't know. I don't know. It's a drum pot, but uh, I have a pitch pine in the collection there uh, with the Don Gould pot, but that's not it. Is this a pitch pine? Yes. Great. This is really one, cool. Yeah, this is a one eye style. This is another one. The, the loop on the number one branch is really interesting. Yeah, yeah. And it's, you know, we can't see the three dimensions. So pictures only show so much of the story. And one of their trees that was on display at the national show, but it's uh, down there in a permanent collection at North Carolina um, is uh, this, this juniper and um, uh, the curator, um, uh, Arthur Jura uh, did the, the woodwork pattern in the background and uh, you can see the wonderful shadow when I took this picture too. So we get uh, even more depth with the design just through, through shadows. And uh, a larch, American larch, has a literati feeling. These are collected in the bogs a lot in Maine and in Canada. And uh, they have uh, these long trunk lines because they're reaching to get out of the bog part of it. And the roots are just as long as the top. And so you have to wean them off roots and it takes a number of years, but uh, you can be very successful with it. And uh, another sumac, and this one's in uh, Pacific Rim collection in uh, Seattle area. But look at the trunk on this one. And this is in a classical non-bond pot. Uh, very shallow. So um, this one always reminds me, um, you know, the, the Chinese uh, being Buddhists uh, uh, burn a lot of incense. And uh, I think some of the design might have been from the smoke coming out of the incense and dissipating into the air. And this is this kind of feeling. Maybe there's a very, very slight breeze that came in different directions and took the smoke up into, into uh, eternity, we'll call it, and uh, dis dissipated, and this is what came out of it. So somebody burning incense uh, can be inspired sometimes. It's another uh, display. I don't remember where that is, but there it is. I've been to over 350 symposiums <laughs> since the 1980s, and some of them blend together. <laughs> so, uh, but this is a picture I took somewhere along the line. And there's Larry and some friends. Uh, the guy Larry's uh, uh, not uh, with social distance is a friend of mine, uh, Ross Adams. He's a great potter out of Pennsylvania. He lives about 30 miles away, or excuse me, 50 miles away. And he comes down with his pots and uh, uh, I, I tend to buy a lot of them. I, he's a very good potter. And Jennifer Price uh, is a student of mine and friend. And she's out of Chicago and she visits a lot except for this year. Uh, we don't get to see each other, and, and then Flex Huvik, who hangs out with us from time to time. This tree uh, was one of my favorite trees. Uh, it's a tree that was collected in uh, five hours north of Toronto many years ago. It had this beautiful trunk line, and uh, I had a pot made for it actually in Czech Republic. And uh, it felt like the, the pot would be decomposing or looks like it's decomposing as the wood is. And so I asked the potter to do 
it like if he sat on it and ripped the clay away from part of it. And so he made two pots for me, and this is the one I chose for the tree. And then a few years ago, the curator, um, Jack Sustick of the National Arboretum, asked if I would donate a tree. And uh, I uh, selected this one uh, for, for the uh, collection. And uh, it's nice because when I go there, I get to work on my own tree that I donated. So uh, since then, it's not so heavy and that uh, lower branch has been brought down even lower. And so there's a separation of the foliage pads or foliage branching and some of it was edited. So each year I go down there and I work with the tree with the curator and the assistant curator. And uh, since then, the assistant curator is um, interning with me. So he comes uh, whenever he can to our place and works on, we work on trees together. And it's a nice uh, relationship I'm getting with this 25 year old man. And uh, he's gonna be uh, uh, a very good artist in very short time. He already is actually. One of my favorite trees I've ever seen on display is this tree. It's a Shimpaku juniper. And uh, what a killer trunk line <laughs> and, and use of dead wood. This was at uh, uh, Coco Futen. I forget what year, but not too many years ago. But uh, just a exquisite tree, uh, everything about it. Uh, the pot, the display table, and of course the tree itself. And when you wake up in the morning, this is how you feel. Uh, maybe not literati, but uh, uh, Steve was uh, just waking up in his jammies. Uh, we have a three-day um, study every year with Walter Paul. One in the spring we call Woodstock, and one in the fall um, we, we call uh, Oktoberfest, and then one in the winter actually uh, is winter with Walter and Jim. And uh, we do things in the yurt and in the studio and in the greenhouse. And uh, uh, actually, I just see this tree is going to, we're going to talk about this tree later in the, in the exhibit. But uh, there's Literati in the morning. <laughs> 